Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to MyBigfootSighting.com. My Bigfoot sighting happened in central Utah. Now, you have to understand, this has been several years ago. I was a teenager, probably, but we were on a family vacation. And I was old enough to drive, and my dad was in the front seat. We were in a pickup truck, and my mom was in the back sleeping in the camper, And we were headed west into either Brigham City or Ogden. I don't exactly remember which, but we were on a four-lane divided highway. And like I said, I was headed westbound, and it was daylight still. On this four-lane divided highway, there was a railroad track on the left-hand side, which should have been the south. And this was all, at that time, in that area where the road was, was flat and open. You could see for quite a ways. The woods were up around the south edge of the road, and there was woods to the north. But the actual part of the highway, it was a particularly flat stretch of that road, which is not particularly flat. It's it's a pretty windy road in from the mountains down into Ogden. And we were planning on going into Ogden that night to camp. So, you know, we were headed that direction. It was about four in the afternoon because it was still daylight enough. You could see, I mean, it was daylight. It was summertime, probably July, give or take. And like I said, we were just on this family vacation tootling along. And out of the right-hand side of the road, which should have been the north, this creature walks out into the road. And I mean, I hit the brakes pretty hard because I didn't expect something walking out of the the trees onto the road where I was driving. And I kind of notioned to my father, I, you know, like pointed, look, and this large creature steps out onto the road. And this was probably six foot something. I, you know, at the time I didn't have any way to judge it, but it was a big, pretty big creature and his hair was gray you could tell it was it had like darker colors underneath it but it was kind of a light gray color all over and the thing that astonished me the most is is it's walking across this road it's not in a hurry but his strides were so big that you know where you and I might take two or three or four steps to get across one lane of traffic I think he made two to get along across one lane, two more to get across the second lane of the road I was on. He went down into the median. I say he, I, you know, I don't know because he was sideways to me. But down through the median, across the other two lanes of traffic, down the embankment, across the railroad tracks, and then went into the woods. And this whole time, we were able to watch him. And I hit the brakes hard enough that I startled my mom. She was mad because she thought I was driving like an idiot. But to see this walk across the road in front of you in broad daylight was startling, to say the least. And to make it even more unique, he turned and looked right at us. Now, I'm not absolutely positive how far initially he was away, but, you know, we were still moving right at him. But when he turned and looked at us, I was so stunned because his face looked so human, it it surprised me. It, it wasn't the ape-like face on a lot of things you see, and the face wasn't covered with hair. His face was skin. And 
when it turned and looked, this face was so uniquely human that I think that was the thing that has caught me all these years because it looked so human in the face, but yet everything else, it was his body was totally covered with hair. The head didn't seem peaked. It was more rounded. And the ears, I couldn't see them. But you could see that, you know, the the bigger neck, the broad shoulders, and the arms that were long, down below the waist, longer than a normal human being, but he was in a full stride. The legs heavy and thick. The biggest thing is, like I said, he was sideways to me and walking across in front of me. But the thing that I remember the most was this gray hair and that face. The rest of it kind of went out of the way because, you know, you're stunned. You're looking at this and he's walking across the road in front of you. And you, we followed him visually all the way across the median, down the embankment, across the railroad track, into the woods. And he was never in a hurry. He didn't run, but he walked upright just like any human would but with bigger strides, incredibly big strides, and very unhurried, not the least bit concerned, and there wasn't really any other traffic out there at the time, so he wasn't having to dodge traffic, but, you know, you see this large, upright creature with hair from top to bottom except on the face, and then this human-looking face that just practically peered right through you as you are looking at it so the whole thing was in daylight and I turned to my father and because I I don't think either one of us spoke until he was out of sight and at the last little bit I'm probably driving parallel or right up to the edge where he went across and like I said I could see him go completely down and into the woods and I turned to my father and I said you saw that right And he said, I saw it. And that was all that was said. I mean, it was, I think we were both just captivated by this thing we were seeing. (laughs) Later on, when we got to our destination, my mom was still mad at me. And she was griping because she thought that I was driving like an idiot. And she was yelling at me. And I'm like, you don't understand. You don't understand what we saw. And we're trying to explain it to her. And even though she was in the truck with us, she didn't believe us because it was like, there's two of us sitting there saying, look what we saw. She never saw it. But she was in the back of the camper and couldn't see out the windows where we could see. There wasn't much said about it between my father and I, even after that. Hardly anything was ever said. But other than that, little few exchanges right there in the seat. You saw that, right? Yeah, I saw that. That's about all that was ever said. You know, trying to explain to my mom, you remember the picture. She had a subscription to, I believe it was National Wildlife Magazine. And when the Patterson film came out, there was a clip of that in that magazine years ago. And that was my first encounter with seeing something like that. And ever since then, I've always been fascinated with it. In fact, I held on to that magazine for years. I don't know where it went now, but seeing that original Patterson film, I was just like, wow, you know, look at this thing. Well, the one I saw was different in that it didn't seem to have breast. It wasn't quite as heavy as that one. And the fur was gray and not black. But I've always been fascinated with Bigfoot since then. And the the chance to see one was just beyond my wildest imagination. I never expected to see one. At that time, there wasn't a lot of sightings that people would talk about. In fact, to even say that you had seen one was almost anathema. People just, they didn't want to even hear about it. Now it's a little bit more common. But Then, and I at the time was probably 16 at the most, to have this thing walk out in front of you in broad daylight was not only just awe-inspiring, it was frightening a little bit, but it was totally unbelievable at the same time because you don't expect to see one. Of course, if you were expecting, it wouldn't be the same thing. But he came out, and you see him in broad daylight, and... 
you you know, you're just flabbergasted. So as I think about this particular one, like I said, you could see the bulk in the shoulders and the body. He was obviously very, very thick, strong. I do remember the legs were, you know, like I said, he was walking upright, a little bit more bent at the knees than maybe a human would walk, but muscular and thick. But he had the same stride as far as the arms swinging, the body moving like a human would. The only difference, like I said, was just to have him turn and look at you with this unreal human face. The the thing that I, I remember, it seemed kind of odd at the time, but he didn't have the flat monkey ape gorilla nose that I would have thought. It, it had a little bit more human features even in the face. And even though I couldn't get close enough to see the color of his eyes, it looked like he was just practically peering right through us. No sound, not a thing. Not sure I could have heard it very well anyway because of the noise of the traffic, but he just kind of stared us down for a few minutes as he walked by, and then he, as he walked on through the median, he turned his head, and the rest of it was just looking at this muscular creature walking across the rest of the roads and into the, the woods. Didn't seem like he could have cared that we were even there, other than when he turned and looked, and it almost, I mean, you had no choice but to hit the brakes, but the look was enough to say, I see you. I'm not worried about you. He was obviously looking at traffic and just went right across in front of me. Now, like I said, since I was a young kid and saw that initial magazine, I would have been really, really young when the original Patterson film was released. So this would have been years later. But even after that, there's always been it seems like something going on of interest around me. And even where I live now, there's activity out here that's just unreal. But even when I was younger, there were several things that were going on. One place that I worked when I was younger, and this would have been back in the Ozarks, I was working at a horse ranch, of all things. And I had a young kid that was helping me in this horse ranch and we were grooming these horses every day and we were, you know, just taking care of the animals as a rule. So we were always talking amongst us and he he was quite a bit younger. He was like probably 10 or 12. And I don't know how the topic came up, but he said, he told me, he says one night where he lived, which was right over the hill from where we were working. And I would take him home occasionally. He said that something came crashing through the woods And I asked him, I said, what are you talking about? And he said, when they were, him and his mom lived in this mobile home down in these, this wooded area, he said, something came crashing through the woods. You could hear it. And he said, it got up to our trailer and you could hear it outside and it was shaking the trailer. He said, you could hear it. And it was, it scared him and his mom very badly. And this, whatever was out there, they never saw it, but they heard it. And it was actually rocking this mobile home that they were in. And I asked him a few questions about it. I said, did you see it? And he said, no. They could hear it out there making noises, and some kind of animal noises. He didn't really describe them. But he said the next day they went out. They After it left, it crashed through the woods the other way. And he said the trees were just broken over. And this kid was an honest little kid. I mean, he, there was no reason for him to lie to me. And it came out of nowhere, this particular story he was telling me. And I'm like, that is so weird. So the next time I took him home, he was pointing out where this thing came through the woods and then the way it left. And he, he said that the trees were all broken. And that was my first encounter with something close to home, at least with his story. And I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. So he didn't have any more to say. He didn't say they'd found any the evidence other than the busted trees and this thing rocking their trailer while they're in it. So when I was in college in this same area, I had a chance to go out and I was doing research for a paper and I was talking to some of the Native Americans in the area. And I was talking to this lady and she was telling me a lot of the old stories of the natives in that area 
the different things about different people and things they could do. And I asked her if they'd ever, we lived in an area along, there was a river that went through there. And I said something about, have you ever heard of a Bigfoot in that area? And she called it a Sasquatch instead of a Bigfoot. And she said, they see him occasionally. She said, they smell him. And I kind of asked her a little more. And she said, oh, yeah, they stink terribly bad. And she said that they see them and they leave them alone. They kind of, they don't bother them. But, yeah, she said they're down on the Shoal Creek. And that was the river that came through that area. And she said they see them occasionally. She didn't elaborate much more about it, but I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. That's not too far from where I lived at the time. And I thought, well, I've never seen one or heard one down there, but, you know, that's nice to know that they did. So fast forward a few years, and not much else was going on until I moved into Arizona. And, wow, the activity out here is ridiculous. I mean, you wouldn't think of all places, you'd, everybody thinks of Arizona as a sandy desert area with cactus. Not where I live. I live in one of the mountain ranges, and there are mountains out here. There are pine trees. It snows. Uh, in fact, it's cold today. And there's areas out here that are just still wilderness because there's not that much population in a lot of these areas. And I'm around some more Native American reservations. <laughs> And so you get into these areas because the Native Americans have a whole different uh, idea and they have a whole different take on what these creatures are, which I'll explain in a minute. But one of the places that I worked was on the Apache, one of the Apache reservations. And there was several of the police officers that, because I was working in emergency medical services and you get to know a lot of the police officers because you're working side by side and quite often. And mind you, this area is beautiful. A lot of people don't understand that there's some places out here that are just breathtaking. And the White Mountains of Arizona are one of those places. There's mountain ranges and canyons, and uh, it's covered with pine trees and forests. There's wild animals of all kinds, elk and deer and turkeys. It's a beautiful place mountains and streams, not what most people think of Arizona. Well, this reservation, when you drive around and work around out there, this one officer said something about, well, they have these ceremonies a lot of times, especially the older generation had a lot of ceremonies for the men and the women, a coming-of-age ceremony they called the sunrise dance. And the men would have theirs off in a different area than the women. And this one guy that I was working with, he said, my sunrise dance was down in here. He said, but they don't do that anymore. And I asked him why. And he said, there were too many things out there. And he didn't quite specify. But later on, I had another officer tell me that we were told not to go down on this one area where there was another river because he said, the boogeyman will get you. And I said, what's the boogeyman? He said, you'll find out. Well, I found out later in this same area, there was an officer on patrol, a woman, and this call came in that there was a prowler out behind this house. So she goes down in this area, and she's going to zip up into the driveway and catch this prowler behind these people's house. And this, of course, was at night. So as she zips up in there, she comes face to face with a Bigfoot, and it had orange hair, kind of brownish-orange hair, because some of the hair got left in the barbed wire fence as it took off, and they were able to gather up some of that hair. And it scared her so bad that she said she would never work the night shift again. Now, this made the newspaper back in this area, and the other officer that I had been talking to who told me about the boogeyman I happened to bump into him, and I said, what do you think about this? And we both know this lady. She's very honest, you know, and would not have made this up, and the family had actually called it in anyway. He said, you remember when I told you about the boogeyman? I go, yeah. He said, that's what I'm talking about. So they had had stories in their lore and their legends about the boogeyman for years when, in fact, it was these creatures. 
they were in that area. They don't talk about them. These particular tribes of Apaches, they don't like notoriety. And so they didn't talk about them at all. They wouldn't talk about what they really were. But that as you learn and find out that they had been told that by this young man telling me, he says, my mother and dad told them that when they would go into the woods to take two rocks and pop them together every so often to let them know that you're friendly. So instead of wood knocks, they were using rocks and they were popping rocks together to let the Bigfoot in that area know that it was okay. They were friendly. They knew what they were and they didn't get bothered by anything. And there were not hardly any stories among them because they didn't want the notoriety. Well, then, now that I'm starting to hear these stories, then I start hearing more in another area of the reservation. And it was pretty close to the same time with you were talking within less than a week that this woman, this police officer saw this one. They saw one very similar to it about probably 15 miles away in another community. It came across the road and some other people saw it. And then there was some uh, another sighting shortly thereafter. I really believe it was probably the same one moving around because I do believe they cover a lot of ground with the stride. But this was all up in an area where there's plenty of game, plenty of fishing if they wanted, plenty of cover. There was so much thick woods that you'd be hard-pressed to find anything. So one of the sightings of this same time, about the same time, was a uh, former police investigator and another deputy sheriff that were driving on the road headed to another location to teach a class, and they saw it also. And this was all about the same week or two weeks in there and in the same general area. So it turns out there was more activity up there than I knew at the time. It was quite active, actually. And then to find out from the natives in the area that this was common, that they saw them quite regularly, but they didn't talk about them. And this was one of the things that the Apaches would not do is talk about them. Yet they have been there for generations from the way that this guy finally told me. Fast forward a few more years, I'm up in another part of this area, but I'm not on the Apache Reservation anymore. I'm now up on the Navajo Reservation, which is a huge reservation in Northeast Arizona. But the situation is very similar. There's a lot more open areas, but there's also a lot of wooded areas, but this population is still sparse. They were the Apaches gathered in communities. The Navajo are spread out in small small communities, but outlying homes and uh, traditional hogans and this type of thing out in the area in this whole huge reservation. But the population is still very sparse because it is so big, the people are spread out. But because of that, There's a lot of sightings that may not even go spoken about, but they are out there. I had a gentleman that I knew from church who said that in this area north of where I work, two guys had been up on a roof and it had snowed the night before, and they were up there trying to finish getting this roof on. And this was up in an area called Salee, and these guys were on the roof, and they looked over, and there were tracks around this house that they were working on that they had not seen and obviously it had snowed overnight so they weren't there the day before and when they got down they realized these were bigfoot tracks now the interesting thing about out here the game and fish rangers for the tribe they collect stories about the bigfoot in this area they had a program not that long ago At the headquarters in Winter Rock, they had an actual, I think, video shows, and they talked about the different sightings in the Navajo Reservation, which covers into New Mexico, Utah, and the little edge of Colorado, and then most of it's in in Arizona. So, I mean, this was common knowledge out here. They see lots of these sightings. They will have people call them in, and they will go check on them and investigate the sightings. If there's tracks, they usually take pictures of them. But it's common knowledge on the Navajo Reservation that Bigfoot are out here. The difference is 
the way that people think about the Bigfoot. They believe that they're a spiritual creature. They are to be revered. They're not to be afraid of them, but they are to be held kind of in high regard. They don't hunt them by any means, but they are, of course, they're like anybody else. If they see one, they'll probably be frightened. But the fact that they actually hold him in a different sort of esteem than anybody else would is kind of fascinating to me. But the story goes that during the Navajo Long Walk, which is very similar to the Cherokee Trail of Tears, the Navajos were pushed out and taken to Bosque Redondo Fort in New Mexico. And during that time, the, a lot of the children, they went and hid. When they saw the soldiers coming, the families told them to run and hide. So there was a lot of kids that were left behind. And the adults were taken away, the ones that got caught. And so there was a lot of these children that were left behind. And the story goes that there were some children that were up in this one area on a mountain, and the Bigfoot would come and bring them food and take care of them. And if one of them was sick, they would take the child, and the Bigfoot would take the child and leave and then bring him back you know, a month or two weeks or whatever later, and the child would be well that they took care of the children that were left behind uh, when the rest of the Navajo were taken away. And so they said they are esteemed and not to be messed with. So they have a different outlook. So in this area, they've had a lot of sightings in an area called the Chuska Mountains, which is up north of Windorock. They've had sightings. Everybody you talk to out here, you, you ask, I have a, a tendency to ask people, have you seen? Have you heard? I'm just like that, which they look at me since I'm a white person and they kind of like, okay, well, this white person, okay, we'll tell them. But people that I know that I could trust, I've had several people tell me they've seen them in certain areas. One was a, a lady who is now deceased, but she was our dispatcher. And she said that she had seen one in this particular road. And this road goes up across this paved road and then it goes up into the mountains now you have to understand that these people are still herding sheep on a regular basis so they're out in the areas that are not necessarily populated and they're running sheep around and following the sheep actually that they follow the sheep as the sheep graze and they bring him back in at night to protect them from the the wolves and the coyotes and whatever else will eat them you know so they go out with them during the day and they're out in the open areas in the areas that are not too populated well, this particular lady that told me she saw one, it just so happens that now I know of two other sightings along this same area, the same pathway, which kind of strikes me as interesting that this is all like there's almost like a, a area that they go through. And the first sighting was a guy that I was working with on a regular basis. I knew him very well. Nice young man. He lived uh, with his mom, which was still taking care of her because his dad had passed away. They lived down in a beautiful valley down below some mountains up there, and he was running cattle and whatever. But in order to even get a phone call out, he would have to drive up on to this road called Navajo Station Road. He would have to drive up there of a morning just to get his cell phone texts his calls, whatever, make the calls that he needed to go because where he was at in the valley, they had no cell service whatsoever, which out in this reservation is not uncommon because it is so sparse with population and anything commercial. There's very little commercial activity out here. So having a cell phone tower anywhere close to you is pretty slim. So this would have been morning. He drives up to where he parks to so he can get his cell phone messages. and. At first, he wasn't paying any attention, but then he starts seeing some brush and stuff wiggling and moving around. And he looks up, and he sees a hairy creature, and it's going in and out of these bushes. Well, he finally got his wits about him since he had his cell phone in his hand. And he finally takes a picture. And all he got was the back. But I have the picture, and... He shows it to me, and I'm like, this is incredible. Because, I, I mean, it was to me, it was obviously a Bigfoot. And to him, it was, too. Because when he saw it, that's the first thing he thought. 
when other people see the picture, they think it's a big one and it was, you know, in there moving in and out of these trees. It wasn't. He said it was about three feet tall. Now, mind you, this guy is not tall to begin with. He's probably five foot one or two. So he would know something three foot tall because it was shorter than him. And he says it had a board in its hand from an old building that had fallen down right there and it was playing. That was his impression that whatever this was, it was playing. But he was also stunned by what he was seeing that, you know, he got one good picture and that was about it. And it's the back. You don't see the front. You just see the back. But you can see the musculature in the back and you can see the arms and that you can see the board that it was playing with. Later on, after he kind of got over the shock, he goes back up there with one of his dogs and he was pretty leery about even going anywhere near that again. Because, like I said, part of it was because of what he saw. Part of it was because of the way they feel about Bigfoot. And, you know, this guy's a full-blood Navajo. And he was a little bit unnerved about going in there. But he finally found an area underneath this huge tree and around these bushes where it appeared that they had been bedded down for the night. When I say they, I'm assuming, and he was too, that there was an adult with this younger one. Well. His sister works for Game and Fish, and needless to say, she put it on Facebook. And he was just mortified because he's kind of a a shy guy, and this wasn't anything he wanted. But everybody in the area knew who it was and what was going on. Well, in this area, they have regional governing centers they call chapter houses. So the next Few, in a few days, he went down there not only to get water because they have to, there's not wells out here. They have to get water from a deep well and take it back to their livestock. And he was down there and they had a chapter meeting and he was there and everybody there knew that he had seen something. Well, the story started going around. There was another guy that lived not too far from him, but down, down the valley said that he had also seen them and that there was two two of these younger three-foot-tall ones, and he saw the pair. And they started talking among themselves, I mean, which the Navajo do quite frequently, but different ones would say, oh, yeah, we leave out food. And different elders will tell you that they leave out maybe a chunk of lamb, and what they call mutton, or they'll leave out vegetables from the garden and leave them out for the Bigfoot to come and get. This is a common thing among several of them that they would leave out for years. They've been doing this, leaving out food and things for the Bigfoot. Then another one told him, and now you can take this for what it's worth, but another uh, one of the elders told him that they had heard one of them talking and that this older lady would talk to the Bigfoot in Navajo and it would respond to him, her in Navajo. Don't know about that one. This is what he was telling me that came out of this chapter meeting. So he was just mortified that this even made the Internet. But I've told you that there was a line from where he was at to where this lady saw one in her car. And then on up over the hill, not too far, another guy that I work with, uh, there's you know two or three of us work in the same office. His mother was out herding sheep. And this one just occurred within the last probably month. And she was out on top of this mesa, and she saw something down below her, and she took a picture. My first thought when I saw this picture, I said, Bigfoot. And he said he wasn't sure. She had seen this creature down there. She took this picture. She showed the picture to a medicine man. Now, you have to understand that there's still medicine men out here. There's still things going on that most people in... The world and the cities would never believe in a million years that still goes on on these reservations because they're isolated. And this medicine man told her that this was a skinwalker. Now, skinwalkers are bad. Skinwalkers are evil. They are bad medicine men, and they use animal skins to cover themselves when they're out doing their bad things. And he said this medicine man was telling her that this is what he saw from the picture that he was writing a name on this rock trying to curse someone else. But because he was seen 
curses that he was trying to put on someone else was going to come back on him, and he would get very, very sick and die. And this, once she took the picture, apparently he realized he whatever it was had been seen turned and left, and she turned and went away too. She she didn't want no part of this. The picture to me looks more like a Bigfoot trying to come up this side of this embankment. It was dark and black colored. I couldn't see the detail they were trying to say that it was a bear skin over some guy. But I think we're dealing maybe with a Bigfoot more than we are something else, but you never know. She's never seen it since, but this occurred about a month ago. This same guy, well, to, to finish that story, so far we've never had anybody in that area die that we are aware of, and that's been about a month ago. But we'll see. You know, if that happens, we'll be with some of the first ones to know. So anyway, the guy, the same guy who his mother saw this one, he was at our quarters. Like, like I said, I work in emergency medicine. We were at the quarters. He left to go walking. He does it every day. He walks around, and we're in a small community. He walks around the school. It's about a mile walk. And he took out to go for his walk that day. And when he came back, you could tell by the look on his face something was really bad. And I asked him, I said, what happened? And he shows me a picture. He said, this was up above, right above the school, right on the edge of town, and what they call the G Hill. The kids have made a big G, you know, like a lot of towns will do. They'll put their initial up on the top of a hill. And he was walking on the road down below this, and he looks up, and there is a Bigfoot standing up on top of this hill, standing by a tree. He sees it. He's able to take a picture, but it's a little fuzzy because it was a ways away from where he was standing. But I've seen that one as well. And this was a pretty good sized one. Whatever it was, it was big and it was black. And you could see that it was just standing there looking down towards him. You don't, you know, like I said, it's fuzzy. It, like a lot of these pictures, it's kind of hazy and fuzzy around the area. So a little bit later, and when he saw that, you have to understand, he was terrified. And this is a, a guy that I've never seen act like that. He he just, I mean, we see all kinds of garbage, but that terrified him. So later on, he goes back to that same area with his wife, has her stand where he was at, and then he goes up the hill and stands where he saw this Bigfoot and stands in the very same place. Now, he is six foot two, and this thing would have been at least a foot taller than he was. I've seen that picture. I don't have that one, but... Like I said, he stood there, had her take his picture, and then he came back down and left. This same hill, they've seen foot tracks in the snow. Uh, a police officer saw those, and I don't know if I have that one or not, but she took pictures of her foot beside this print, and it was pretty good size, and it was a barefoot track, but it was not human. It was big. And then later on, somebody else saw it at that same hill, just below that, it goes right towards a, a small wash and to the lake. And somebody saw it going across the wash. And then about a few hours later, they saw it in another town in a little community. And this person literally came face to face with it. I don't know what they were doing. Came face to face with it and scared them out of their ever-loving mind. So these kind of things are going on all the time right around here where I'm at. I asked one of the deputy sheriffs the other day if he'd had any reports. He's another native guy that I know, and he says, he said, not anything just real recently, but he's had reports down in a community called Lupton, which is down near, it's right across Interstate 40. I mean, and this thing was crossing Interstate 40. And they've seen apparently more than once in that area, and there's a bunch of big rocks, very rugged area. We're talking plateaus and mountains. If it got up in there, it'd be hard pressed to anybody to see it, but they do see him in that area. And then from where I'm at, I was told there was one sighted not too far from where I live. And I was looking around trying to find any information on it. And just to the west of me, there were some people again on Interstate 40 that saw one cross the road in front of them and go back up to the north. And it was a man and his wife. And it, I think it was the BFRO 
that had the report and I was reading it and they were saying, oh, there's no water around here. And I'm going, that's not true. There is a water source on the south side of the road. There's a lot of elk that hang out down there and there's a pond in there. But if you don't know it's there, you would never see it. It's completely covered with trees. And this is an area where the deer and the elk run across. It's a well-known animal traffic. And it was following that same path, went right up the road where another man that I knew lived there and disappeared. But they saw it in daylight. And this people said that other people had to have seen it because it was in daylight on Interstate 40, which is very heavily traveled. So, you know, these things are out there, a lot of them. I mean, this is just kind of a strange side note, but there's a canyon not too far from where I live. And this canyon is totally covered with pictograph or pictures that they have either pecked up into the rock and the patina. And it's amazing. And these are ancient things. So I'm in there and I've taken a bunch of the Civil Air Patrol kids down there to see this. I was helping them out for a long time and a whole bunch of them. Now, these kids know that I had a fascinated with Bigfoot, so they, we were always teasing each other. But there's a whole bunch of us. There's several adults, several kids down in there with us, and we're looking at the, all this stuff, taking pictures. And we come upon this one pictograph on the side of the canyon wall. And the first thing, all the kids go, Bigfoot. And it is the most strange pictograph I have ever seen. But it was bigger than everything else, had huge feet, it had huge hands. And if I'm not mistaken, it had six fingers and six toes, which is kind of uncommon for most pictographs out here. But it had this big head and something in the neck that looked, you'd think it was the things of Frankenstein. I don't know, but it was really unusual. But even the kids, the first thing they said was Bigfoot when they saw this pictograph. And I thought, well, if we've got them now, they should have seen them then because this would have been an ancient pictograph. But that's beside the point. The other thing that was very telling that I've run across recently, we were getting these same kids. We would take up to an area called Big Lake, which is on the the U.S. Forest Service. It's out by Greer, Arizona. And there's this lake up there that people like from Phoenix and stuff, they come up and vacation for the weekend or whatever. It's very popular during the summer. And we had been asked to go up there and teach the campers, the kids, give them something to do. So we would go up there and teach them some stuff just for fun. And these were all kids that were out there. So most of these Civil Air Patrol kids were between 14 and 18 years old. So they're, they're not children by any means. But anyway, I went to the Forest Service office to arrange for this to be done during the summer. And I'm talking to these people at the Forest Service office, and they're, we're in eager and just on a whim, I had heard that there was a Bigfoot in that area from someone else. And this is right below the Apache Reservation where those other people were seeing these Bigfoot on a regular basis, not too far from a lot of those other sightings. So I asked one of these Forest Service people, I said, does anybody ever see a Bigfoot up there? It, just a casual, flippant question. And... She was one of the ones that goes up to this visitor center that is at the Big Lake. And that's where we would do our little programs for these kids was at the visitor center. Now, in the summertime, there would be tons of people in there. They'd bring up their RVs and all kinds of stuff. If they weren't in RVs, they were in tents and campers. And they would dry camp away from the park or from the Big Lake. And so there were people fishing as well, but you'd also have people off into the woods all around this area. So, I mean, this was a very popular spot in the summer. So I asked this woman, I said, have you seen a Bigfoot as you're going up there? And she just looked at me with this astonished look on her face and dead silent. And I looked back at her and just the look on her face told me, you've seen one. And I asked her, I said, have you seen one? And she goes, we all have. I said, what do you mean? She said, every person from that office that has gone up there in the summertime because they go early in the morning to be open at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's probably an hour drive up there, said every one of us, and she was numbering about seven or eight of them, have seen a Bigfoot in that area at one time or another. 
And I stood there with my mouth hanging open. I said, you're kidding. She said, no. And she, and she kind of gave me this, like, you're the first one that's ever asked us kind of look, you know. But she said, every one of them have seen one in that area. And again, we're talking a place with lots of cover, lots of trees, lots of game. There's wildlife all over that area up there. Lots of water, fishing, all this. And we're talking in an area that would be contiguous with the Apache Reservation and all the other stuff that goes on over there, the, all the sightings they've had. So this is coming from four service members, and she was a little reluctant to talk about it, but the more I asked her, she just, here it came. She just blurted it out. So I'm standing there, I'm kind of surprised. But uh, there had been other people that I had talked to had heard strange things up there. So this stuff is happening a lot in this area. I know for a fact that the BFRO has been up in the Chuskas and the group they sent up there, they got ran out of there by something pitching rocks at them. And they had been in there particularly because of sightings. And something, more than one, they said, I think there was two or three of them, they think, started chucking rocks at the people in there in this group that went in there and they couldn't hang around. So when you start looking at the sightings, they are all along this area of the White Mountains and all the way up into Flagstaff. There's been several sightings in Flagstaff. In fact, there was one up there probably in the last two months. I saw this one. I think it was in the newspaper. I, I read about it, but they've had sightings in there. So there's activity all around in this area. The time that we hear about them the most where I'm working is in the fall when they start getting the pinyon nuts. The Navajo go out and collect the pinyon nuts that come from the trees. And you have to pick them up off the ground. Well, usually you're not in a populated area, obviously. If you're going to be where the pinyons are, you're out in the woods away from everybody. And the pinyons only bear about every four years. So you'll pick one year, you'll be in this place, and in another year, you'll be someplace else. Well, the, the last time that they were bearing in the area close to where we were at, we had three reports within a week of people seeing what they believe was a Bigfoot back in that area. And they were frightened. I mean, most people were pretty scared. Another lady that I work works at the hospital, who I'm seeing quite often, she had something crash through, not just step over a fence, but crash through and knocked it down. And there were prints in the mud. And the prints that I saw, the, she had several pictures of them. They did not look like bear tracks. These looked bigger than that. And they had a heel with toes. It looked like a, a regular footprint. It looked like a Sasquatch print to me. And she had them in the mud. And they called the rangers out to look at it. And the, the rangers, oh, no, no, you know, we don't know what it is. But they took pictures of it as well. And like I said, the Navajo rangers, the game and fish people, they take these reports on a regular basis, take pictures, and then they have a program. And they were showing a program, which I didn't get a chance to see. I wanted to go, but I was working. But I wanted to see this program to see what they had to say about them because every place you go out on this reservation, you talk to somebody, they will tell you that this is how the, the Navajo feel about them. The Navajo also, they see them quite regularly. Uh, like I said, when I get the opportunity off and on, I'll ask somebody just out of curiosity. I, I'm bad about this. I just, you know, I'll flippantly ask somebody. And most of the time they will tell you if they've seen one, they will tell you. And some of them will laugh you off, but most of them won't. Most of them realize that, hey, it's here. We don't mess with them, but they're here. And there's quite a few of them from the numbers that I see, at least from what I've, the people I've talked to. But the one that I think that is the most striking is this three foot or three and a half foot tall one that this young man took the pictures of. I can kind of describe this one to you a little bit. Like I said, from the picture, you couldn't tell exactly how tall he was, but the hair was kind of a almost golden brown color and it was going away from you, but it had a long arms muscular. And if it was a child, you could see every bit of the muscles in the back. And, you know, just from looking at it, you can tell this is not a suit. 
There is no way. If it was, it had to have been the most form-fitting suit I've ever seen in my life. And it had the stick that he described that it was playing with, but he just didn't see the second one if there was another one in there. But it was playing. That was the way he described it, is it was playing. <laughs> I think at the time, after it ran into the trees, he got frightened enough that he drove off. And then it kind of hit him what he saw. And it wasn't that far from his own home. I think that's kind of what tipped him, too, is, you know, he was just up the hill from his house. And there it was. So it was really a unique picture. I just wish we could have gotten the other side of it. And I think initially he did see the other side, the face. But you know how it is. Uh, when you see one of these things, you're so stunned that many times you don't stop and take a picture. Even though you got your camera in your hand, you're just blown away by what you're looking at. You don't have anything to do but stand there and look. And I think that's kind of what had happened to him. It just shocked him so bad and surprised him that it took him a minute to get his wits about him enough to take the photo. And when he did, he got the backside, which is still very unusual and very appealing because it's like you don't see an animal like that. It was upright, messing around, and you could tell, you know, it it was walking away from him. But like I said, he described it as playing. So... An unusual situation, an unusual encounter, but I don't expect that this will be the last one up here. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised to get many more because they are out here more than I ever, ever expected. But I find it fascinating. I would love to see another one. After seeing the one, I've always wanted to see another because it is just so fascinating to see these things, to know that it's something not everybody does get to see. And you've been privileged to get a look at something that you're not sure exactly what it is. To this day, I mean, I can't, it, it definitely wasn't human. It definitely wasn't ape, the one that I saw. But you feel, well, I mean, it, I feel privileged when I get to see like a bald eagle, which I get to see off and on. Even a, a beautiful elk, I feel privileged to see these. But to see a Bigfoot is just phenomenal. I just am taken aback that I was privileged to see one. And there's more out here. There are other sightings. I, I'm trying to think there's more. There's been guys from the Forest Service down on the Apache Res that had a whole family walk in front of him. He was taking wood cutting permits on a back road and people coming in and cutting wood. And he had a whole family group, a male, female, and a couple of kids walk in front of him at four o'clock in the afternoon. And he didn't want his name mentioned because like I said, the Apache don't like notoriety. But he saw one. There's been sightings like that off and off and on. Just for years, I've run across these people that have seen them. So this is a hotbed area as far as I'm concerned. And there's a lot of places for them to hide. There's lots of places for cover. Lots of places you'll never see them either because you could walk for miles and never see another soul. You might see a sheep or two. You might see some other game and stuff, but you're not going to see people. And this is the same way on the Apache Res. There's places down in there you could stay forever and never be seen because it is so wild and woolly out here. And people don't realize that. It's not like it's being in the middle of the Kansas grassland. You're in the middle of the forest and the woods and the canyons and the hills and the mountains. It's not like any place you've ever seen. And there's places that they could hide all day long and never be seen. And there's plenty of fish and game and places for them to eat. They would never have any trouble about things like that. So like I said, for myself, having a chance to have seen one, it just makes me want to see another. A lot of people I realize are frightened and they would not want to ever see another one. I would love to see another one as long as I'm not getting confronted, but from a distance, you know, a little distance would be fantastic. But I, I don't know. I just feel privileged that I got the chance to see the one. If I get a chance to see a second one, then so be it. I'm ready. But I think that's about all I have for you. I, I don't know if there's anything else I can think of at the moment to tell you about. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down no horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rose
where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back to the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track and it been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch breaking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah In the tremolo Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music The pace of the city life drives me wild The only tune is the cars rushing by on the stereos booming When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Some call it backwards, backwards and double time Getting in the soul and the tremor on Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming out country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out Mama's best sweet tea Got the sound 